Hello and welcome to Avi's Conversational Corner, a podcast on history, culture, and politics in a broad perspective. I am your host, Avi Wolf. It was a time of rapid, terrifying, and exhilarating change, a time of scientific breakthroughs, mass politics, endless scandals, and efforts at reform, a time when new groups of Americans fought for and sometimes won their right to participate fully in American life, while others did their best to try and keep America as it was, or as they imagined it to be. With few heroes, many villains, great geniuses, and piercing questions, many of which still trouble us today. Welcome to Stumbling Colossus, a regular part of Avi's Conversational Corner, covering the gilded and progressive ages of the United States, from the end of the Civil War to the end of the First World War. You can find this and other episodes of Avi's Conversational Corner at Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. This episode's topic, the rise of the U.S. Navy. The Gilded Age is the story of America rising to become one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful country on earth, economically speaking. And no tool of statecraft was more important for defending power and spreading influence in this age than a large and powerful Navy. As different presidents and parties debated what they needed a Navy for, passive defense, power production, or more, the Navy itself grew from a small coastal force to one of the largest modern fleets afloat. How did the Navy adapt to these changes? How did the public? How did they contend with the new challenges in naval theory and technology that came thick and fast in this era? With me to discuss these questions and more is Dr. James Renfro of the Naval History and Heritage Command. Chris, welcome. So let me ask you the question uh, that I ask uh, almost all my guests in one form or another. Uh, a naval scholar or observer from a friendly or neutral nation comes to study the U.S. Navy's doctrine, approach, weapons, and tactics uh, at the beginning of our period, or right after the Civil War, in the middle of our period, around the 1890s, and before America's entries into the First World War. What would they find in each period? What would have changed? What would have stayed the same? The, the, the post-Civil War U.S. Navy. Uh, it uniformly gets a bad name. Uh, Here's a motley collection of wooden ships. They're not modernized. They're antiquated. They're backward. American naval tactics are backward. Obviously, these people in this time period didn't know what they were doing. They were unprofessional. Uh, You can fill in the blank, right? But before we're so quick to dismiss uh, the post-Civil War U.S. Navy, I think context is really important here. Uh, and I tell students that the, co- the country got exactly the Navy it was willing to pay for during this time frame. Uh, so let's, if you are the United States at the end of the Civil War, um, you know, what, what is threatening you? What are the threats? It's important to remember, and it's very difficult for us from the 21st century to put ourselves into this, into this mindset, because we are so used to the United States being a world power, that that it's almost, you know, it's, it's, um, it's completely built into us. And you have to divest yourself from that and understand that uh, the United States is not a world power, uh, that we do not have any overseas interests, uh, and that, um, that there is no existential threat to the United States homeland. So war planners have looked at this, and they've decided that um, really the only European power that could even possibly legitimately attack the United States homeland would be Great Britain, uh, of course, through their holdings in in Canada. And, and, you know, as we know, the British have tried this at least once, uh, and it was a spectacular failure, with the possible exception uh, of burning Washington, D.C. in 1814. So it's just, it's really not a legitimate threat. Uh, so if you have, if you have no overseas interests, if you have no existential threat to the homeland, then and you have other things that you want to spend time, energy, and money on, namely number one, reconstruction, which was exceptionally expensive and took a lot of time and a lot of energy, uh, and westward expansion which was also taking up most of the steel production in the form of uh, railroads uh, and whatnot, um, it, it, then, then what are you willing to spend money on? Uh, what, what do you need in terms of a Navy? Well, the answer to that is that you need, uh, 
uh, ships who can protect our merchant shipping, who can show the flag and protect our commercial interests in ports around the world. Well, to me, this sounds a lot like you need ships that have very long time on station, are relatively inexpensive to operate, um, and, and, you know, and are, have the ability to land a bunch of sailors with rifles occasionally, uh, or make a nice show of taking uh, a city in some foreign port somewhere under the fire of their cannons uh, occasionally. All right. So in other words, wooden sailing ships, sort of early to mid 19th century wooden ships fit the bill perfectly. So by European standards, yes, they're antiquated. Uh, but, you know, quite frankly, they were exactly what the United States needed and more importantly, what the United States government was willing to pay for. Uh, so this is the this is the Navy of the 1860s and the early 1870s. Well, as, as we move into the 1870s, as we move into to sort of what you refer to as the middle part of our time period, several things begin to change and there's changes not only from a kind of a nat national interest point of view, uh, but there's also changes within the Navy itself. Now, my argument is it, it kind of the touchstone for all of these changes is an event called the Virginius Incident, uh, which happens in late 1873. And what happens is that the, the Virginius is an ex-Confederate blockade runner uh, that is captained by an ex-Confederate naval officer, actually a graduate of Annapolis. The guy's name is Fry, Captain Fry. And, and it's a mercenary ship. It, it is running guns to the rebels in Cuba who are, this is the, the first of the several times that they try uh, to throw off Spanish rule uh, on the island of Cuba. Uh, and uh, in the 1870s, uh, the, the folks, the Cubans are busy fighting with the Spanish. And of course, people in the United States are only too happy to make money on, off this by running the guns and people down to the rebels. Well, the Virginius gets caught by the Spanish uh, Navy and they take Captain Fry and, uh, you know, uh, about 50 of his crew and they execute them, uh, which, uh, you know, you think, well, that might be justified, but these are, in fact, American citizens. And so this is a problem. And for a brief moment there in late 1873 to 1874, we think that, in fact, we may have to go to war with Spain. So... We see the United States, because of regional interests, i.e. the Caribbean, which the United States since the time of Thomas Jefferson has always considered to be its backyard, uh, might in fact have to have an armed encounter with a European power. And so we, we go about kind of readying the fleet to, to possibly uh, be able to fight Spain. And, and so uh, we recall the ships from the European station. We recall the ships from the South American station. They all meet off of Key West, Florida um, for a series of exercises in late 1873 to 1874. And, and to make a long story short, uh, these exercises are a complete disaster. They are a laughing stock. Um, if you can imagine in your mind a bunch of kind of wooden uh, 1850s era ships that can do a max speed of, you know, maybe seven or eight knots uh, with everything open but the toolbox, uh, driving around in formation trying to look like a fleet of European battleships, uh, you know, this is what the United States Navy is doing. Uh, and uh, they, they come home from this and uh, several of the junior officers, um, well, you know, uh, uh, a, a report gets published in the pages of the Naval Institute Proceedings, which is a relatively new, the Naval Institute is founded in 1873, and the Proceedings of the Naval Institute is a kind of a brand new forum or platform for the junior officers to be able to voice issues that they have with the Navy. And so really one of the first, you know, I don't know, 20 articles of Proceedings Magazine is an article in 1874 about these exercises uh, and what a complete laughing stock the United States Navy is. And so this generates a ton of discussion within the Navy. But I argue that the other thing the Virginius Affair does is it, it really uh, makes the government, not just the Navy, but the government for the first time realize that, hey, if you are going to have these ambitions uh, 
you know, beyond your borders, beyond your home waters, if you're going to have these ambitions that, hey, you know, the, the, the Caribbean is a, a place of high national interest or whatever, then you're going to have to back those ambitions up with something besides wooden ships. Um, otherwise, you know, otherwise it's not going to work. Eventually, you're going to come in, into contact with some European power uh, and the results are not going to be favorable. Now, it turns out that we end up not going to war with Spain in 1874, which is good for us. Uh, I mean, l make no doubt that that that, uh, that would have ended very differently than the War of 1898 eventually ends um, 20 years later. Uh, but uh, the United States Navy was, was nowhere near that point in 1874. All right, so, so what does that do? Um, the Navy begins to, 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 it opens this conversation about, well, what kind of Navy do we need? If we've all come to sort of a rough conclusion that uh, we need to have something more than uh, kind of uh, wooden ships, um, what does that look like? And, and so what you get here, at least within the Navy, you, you get the, the Naval Advisory Boards of 1881 and 1882. And so uh, these Naval advisory boards, uh, <laughs> this shows you the amount of, of um, disagreement that there is among some of these very basic things. Um, the, the Naval Advisory Board of 1881 actually issues two opinions. They have a majority opinion and they have a minority opinion. Uh, and the argument has to do with how many ships of, of, of what kind they need to purchase. But, you know, eventually they come up with, well, we need to we need so many uh, unarmored cruisers. So I want you to notice that even these Naval Advisory Boards of the 1880s, they're not calling for ships that can actually enter into peer-to-peer -peer combat against a European battleship. They're, they're stopping short of that. They're saying, well, we need to modernize our ships. We need steel warships. They should have modern weapons on them. Uh, we don't really need to build battleships. Um, but they, uh, they eventually they, you know, I forget exactly what the number is, but they say that we should build like 50 ships of all these different types or whatever. Well, there's no way that Congress in 1880 has any intention of paying for any of this. They're certainly not going to build 50 new warships. Uh, and so the results of the 1881 Naval Advisory Board are sort of laughed off. Uh, but, but then eventually what happens, I mean, not that this you know, is necessarily a good thing or has anything to do with the Navy. But when James Garfield is assassinated uh, in 1881, his, uh, 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 when uh, Chester Arthur um, uh, administration comes in and we get a change in Navy administrations, we get a change in Secretary of the Navy, and they do another Naval Advisory Board in 1882 that basically says, hey, I want you to take, you know, this kind of mess that these people came up with in 1881, and I want you to fix it and come up with some kind of uh, uh, actual recommendations. And again, to kind of make a long story short, uh, what you get out of the Naval Advisory Board of 1882 is you get the authorization to build the first four steel warships of the so-called New Steel Navy, which are authorized in 1883, and that is the Atlanta, the Boston, the Chicago, and the Dolphin, the so-called ABCD ships. They are, they are not armored in the way that battleships are armored, but they are metal and they have electricity and they have refrigeration and they are primarily steam powered although they have they do have a full sail rig and they can be you know they can sail if they need to uh, but this kicks off the so-called modernization uh, of the navy and, and this is in the kind of the mid 1880s uh, time frame and then this this begins to really accelerate as we move towards the end of the 1880s and the 1890s. And there's a lot of work going on in the Navy. There's a lot of innovation going on in the Navy during this time. Uh, we are learning about self-propelled torpedoes and the establishment of the torpedo school in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, we are thinking about tactics and about naval strategy. You get the establishment in 1884 of the Naval War College also located in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, we're thinking about, you know, how do we most effectively, um, how do we most effectively damage armored 
European style battleships or warships. And, and one of the important things to remember about this time, not to digress too much, but, but this is a, you know, in military history, we talk about sometimes the offense is on the rise and sometimes the defense is on the rise. And, and military history is kind of this sine wave of offense and then defense and then offense and then defense. And uh, we are definitely in a time period in naval warfare where the defense is predominant, right? So we've figured out how to armor warships, but what we haven't figured out how to do very effectively is, is, is actually uh, is, is uh, uh, um, how to aim our naval gunfire, right? So hitting these armored ships is very difficult. Um, so the question then becomes, well, if, you know, if we're having a hard time hitting armored warships with naval gunfire, you know, what do we do to damage them? Well, we can shoot a torpedo at them from a torpedo boat. We can ram them. You know, rams become a thing for a little while. And maybe the idea is we're simply going to, to drive around and try to... Anything that will gouge a large hole in one of these ships underneath the waterline, that's been proven to sink them really, really effectively. So, you know, anyway, I, I, we can get into more of that if you want to. But the, you know, there's all of this. The 1880s and the early 1890s are a time where, you know, where naval planners are working through all of this stuff and you get some very sort of oddball and one-off you know ship types as they're trying as they're as they're um, uh, trying to deal with what is the most effective uh, kind of uh, ship I anyway um, it, let's let's approach the 1890s and as we get into the 1890s uh, Amer Americans are kind of done expanding across the westward frontier, right? You know, Frederick Turner Jackson very famously says in 1893, says the frontier is closed, right? So where else are we going to expand to? Well, the answer to that question is overseas. And, and specifically the answer is, you know, for our commercial interests, all of these companies which are no longer selling stuff to all of these pioneers that are headed across the American frontier, you know, wh who are they going to sell things to? Well, China and Asia and overseas. And so with these new overseas American commercial interests come new, you know, interests in maintaining a permanent presence uh, in Asian waters overseas uh, comes, uh, you know, uh, it comes the idea that we need to continue to develop our fleets and that we, in fact, now is the time when we need to build battleships. And our, our first American battleship, the Indiana class, the first purpose built uh, warship that was built to actually be an offensively capable battleship uh, is the Indiana class, which comes online in 1894. Um, and, and uh, you know, from there, uh, we continue to purchase battleships and whatnot. And, and, and that gets us up to uh, what we refer to as the Spanish-American War, and more properly the, the, the War of 1898 or the Spanish-Filipino-Cuban-American War, uh, and the state of the Navy at that time, which, uh, you know, is a Navy that is able to take on a European power, albeit a, a flagging European power, but the, the Spanish, uh, with a great deal of success. So, uh, you know, again, wooden ships, you know, 1860s, 1870s, wooden ships, and there's reasons why we have these safe sail power wooden ships at this point in time. Uh, you get the, the, the sort of the realization in the mid-1870s that we've got to modernize our fleet and do something better. Uh, that leads to the ABCD ships, uh, which come online, um, 1883, 1884 is when they're authorized. And then the authorization of the first true American battleships in the mid 1890s, uh, in 1894. Uh, so that's that's kind of our our three eras and some of the modernization that's going on at that time. Okay, so let me uh, divert attention a little bit from the Navy, uh, which you uh, very nicely uh, summarized and explained. Uh, how they developed, how they wished to modernize, and so forth. And let's talk a bit about the public. Uh, when I interviewed uh, Dr. Wayne Che about this, the U.S. Army uh, during this period, he talked about how, in addition to, to like the Navy being chronically underfunded, um, the Army was an institution, albeit a federal institution, one of the few federal, truly national institutions around. Um, it didn't really have a lot of prestige. He mentioned how... Um, 
he mentioned how uh, they were they were basically uh, joined by what he called the most desperate members of society, uh, people who really had nowhere else to go uh, and just needed a job. Um, was the situation that bad uh, for the U.S. Navy, or did over time uh, people from I guess without trying to sound snobbish, people from like the better sort or from uh, more affluent regions say, hey, joining the Navy is cool. It's good. It's uh, it's prestigious. It's something I can go uh, back to jo- uh, show the girls. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a little bit different uh, for the Navy uh, because so in the era of, in the age of sail, uh, you know, the only people that really are going to join the Navy are, you know, sailors, right? So in general, you are, um, you're recruiting people from the Eastern seaboard uh, and particularly from the Northeast uh, that are um, the sailors on these ships. And, and that really is the way that it is, you know, up until the Civil War. Um, and it is, uh, it, it's, it's not the sort of thing that somebody from the, the, the old Northwest or, or for really from the West is going to go do uh, that begins to change as we get into the, the, what, you know, the so-called new steel Navy of the 1880s and the 1890s. Um, we start to get a change in, in how we're recruiting people. And there, there becomes this realization that we can't just kind of depend on sailors who maybe are between merchant voyages and think, well, I'll hop out, you know, I'll enlist on a Navy ship and I'll do a cruise with them. It's also just as a side note, it's important to understand how these ships were manned, right? We think of today, we think of like going to your recruiter and um, signing up uh, for maybe a four-year enlistment and you get a nice enlistment bonus or something and and, and you're enlisted for four years and then you get discharged. Uh, And that's not how the Navy worked. Um, The the Navy enlisted sailors by cruises. And so you would take one of these wooden frigates and say, let's, you know, for the sake of argument, let's say the USS Constitution. The Constitution is going to go on cruise. It's going to go out to the Mediterranean. It's going to be gone for a couple of years. And so you would have what they called a rendezvous, a naval rendezvous, and you'd put out the word and you'd say, hey, the Constitution is crewing up. You know, who wants to come beyond the Constitution? Uh, Come to the naval rendezvous in Boston. And uh, folks looking for work, sailors looking for work, basically would show up at these naval rendezvous and they would be mustered into the Navy and they'd, you know, head out to their ship. The ship would go out on deployment, what we would call deployment today, or go out on cruise, and it would be gone for a couple of years or whatever. It would come back, and then they would pay off the crew, and then they were out of the Navy. That, and so, and, and unless you know there was another ship that was looking for people, and, and so sailors referred to this as shipping over. And a lot of times, even in today's parlance, when sailors talk about reenlisting, they'll say, "We, yeah, I'm shipping over." You know, so that that's a term that has kind of hung around. Uh, so. It wasn't like we were going out and, you know, trying to recruit people from all over the nation and bring them in for a certain set period of time, right? It was just, you would crew up these ships as you needed a crew, and then you would pay the crew off when the ship came into port. So um, this starts to change with the New Steel Navy. And the thing that changes about it is the new technologies and the need for a more specialized skill set than simply being able to um, I say simply, it was extremely difficult, you know, to, to be able to work sails and tie knots and, and do the sorts of things that, that sailors did. Now you began to need sailors that could work on steam engines, and you began to need sailors that could work on e- electrical motors, and you began to need sailors that could tend to the radio systems and, and this kind of stuff. And where are you going to get these people? You can't just have a naval rendezvous and say, hey, we need, you know, electricians to come down and sign up to join the Navy, right? So you, you've got to have some sort of a better plan than that. And, and so we begin, and plus, as the Navy is growing, it's not just enough to kind of show up in Boston and hope that there's enough extra sailors laying around that you can crew out a ship, right? Now now we need to reach into the heartland, and we need to reach to Indiana and Ohio and wherever else, and we need people to want to join the Navy um, and, and people that have the education to be able to do some of these skilled uh, 
uh, thing. And so there's a few variations of, of how the Navy does this. One of the things that they experiment with is the so-called apprenticeship program. And actually one of the guys that's really a mover and shaker in this apprenticeship program is uh, Stephen Luce, uh, who goes on later to found the Naval War College in 1884. But in the 1870s, Luce is um, the CEO of an apprenticeship that, that, you know, basically is recruiting, you know, good, well-educated, I, I should say white, uh, boys from all over the country and bringing them to these ships and training them and then sending them out into the fleet. Um, and there is really a racial component here that I have to be sure to point out because of, of all the services, the Navy actually was the most inclusive in the 1800s. Uh, the, the, the sailors were sailors were sailors. And once you got away from the shores of the United States, no one particularly cared what color you were. So uh, as long as you could tie knots and climb up in the rigging, right? But, but at the same time that we see Jim Crow begin to take place in the United States in the late 1880s and 1890s as, the, as the, you know, in the, the post-Reconstruction United States, as Jim Crow starts to take hold, the segregation of the Navy uh, it follows right along suit <clears throat> because we're trying to recruit people that are educated, people that have the ability to do some of these specialized uh, technological things. And of course, that is going to leave out people of color. Um, and so it is right about this time period that African Americans are essentially relegated to being stewards. Uh, which holds up until the uh, Second World War. Um, but, uh, the, you know, by the 1890s, we, and, and it's the, the idea of what we think of today as boot camp doesn't really come around until World War I. Uh, but by the 1890s, we've definitely got this idea that we need to be recruiting people from all over the country giving them some form of training and then trying to retain them for more than just like one cruise. And there are some things that help with this in the 1890s too. Refrigeration is a big one. Uh, if you can tell a sailor that you can have something to eat other than, you know, hard tack and boiled pork or whatever it was that they used to eat on the sailing ships, if you've got electricity and refrigeration, now people can have things like fresh vegetables. Uh, you can have actual, you know, good meals. <coughs> and so, um, that is really useful. This idea of join the Navy and see the world uh, kind of becomes a thing. Uh, and, and so those are, those are kind of the changes in recruitment and the caliber and types of uh, folks that we're trying to get to become sailors uh, in the 1880s and 1890s. That's an excellent introduction. Um, so you mentioned the Naval War College. Um, and very famously, there's a lot of uh, debate and discussion, uh, especially in the 1890s uh, and the early 20th century, uh, about the purpose of um, the purpose of a navy, what it should aim for. Should it aim for great battles? Should it aim for area denial? Uh, are there is there a basically a grab bag of tactics that apply to each situation? Most famously, uh, between uh, the American Alfred Thayer Mahan uh, and the British uh, scholar Julie, Julian Corbett. Um, to what extent did the people who actually run the ships or command the fleets take an interest in this debate? Or did they perhaps say, you know what, we know the practical stuff. Uh, those scholars could continue uh, debating theory, uh, but uh, we know what we're doing. No, I'd say absolutely the officer corps at this time takes a big interest in this. And, and you know, the pages of the Naval Institute proceedings are filled with essays about, you know, what the Navy should be doing, how it should be employed. And, you know, one of my major arguments is Mahan, Mahan's the guy that comes along uh, in uh, the early 1890s, and he is the guy that is a talented writer, and he puts the words to paper and gets the credit uh, but the stuff that Mahan is talking about, naval officers have been talking about uh, for years prior, uh, and uh, and that and there's there's an excellent article about this, and I, I wish that I could think of the guy's name off the top of my head. Uh, that the article is ten years before Mahan, uh, 
um, it, you, you know, you can find that on JSTOR or you can Google it. And, and um, you know, the, ar the, the article basically makes the argument that I just laid out. Um, Naval officers are thinking about these things. They're writing about them in the pages of the Naval Institute proceedings. They're practicing them in fleet exercises. Uh, they're, you know, the, the Navy is really working hard to be a professional Navy on the European model well before uh, Mahan writes his famous book. And, and Mahan kind of gathers all this up and writes it down. And, and he's a very talented writer and he makes a great argument and it takes off like wildfire. Um, but, you know, I, one of the things you find in, that I say in my book is, the, you know, the Navy's already there. The officer corps of the Navy is already there. Uh, and Mahan's, you know, leading them down the home stretch, uh, but um, but it, it's not it's not a chicken and the egg kind of thing. It's it's not like he came first and then the naval naval officer corps uh, came along later and fell in line with his ideas. The naval officer corps is thinking all these things. They're practicing them. They're developing them, uh, and and he uh, you know he turns it into readable language for the common citizen. So, developing the fleet. Uh, discussing theory, uh, doing their best to modernize the Navy, uh, which brings us um, a little bit past uh, the field that you covered, but I think which is a very uh, important period uh, in American life in general and also in the American uh, Navy. Uh, World War I hits. And although America stays neutral uh, for three years, uh, there are two things that would seem to me, at least to at least in theory, uh, interest the Navy. First of all, you have uh, the practical, you have large battles, you have area denial, you have blockade, you have piracy, you have the use of uh, submarine torpedoes to sink dreadnoughts like in the Mediterranean. Uh, and I was curious, uh, how, to what extent did the American Navy take an interest in the European conflict? And especially, how much did they want to get involved before, uh, say, in protecting American merchant shipping um, uh, before uh, President Wilson uh, declared war and the Senate approved it? So there's a huge movement in, you know, 1915, 1916 called the preparedness movement. Uh, that, that is basically what you've just described, right? Uh, Americans that are tracking what's going on in the First World War very closely, that are that are interested in uh, being prepared. And everybody thinks that preparedness means like being prepared to enter the war, and, and that's not really what the preparedness movement was. The preparedness movement was we got to be prepared for what comes after, because one of the things that we understand that is going to happen, we're not sure how the first world war is going to end. We're not sure we're going to fight in it, but we're pretty sure all these empires are going away, right? Which is you know basically what happens. So, so we have to be prepared to step in and take the next steps on the world stage. Um, what does that look like for the Navy? What that looks like for the Navy is in 1916, the, the, you know, the, the um, Naval Appropriations Bill in 1916 very famously says that we're going, and, and Wilson says this too, so we're going to have a Navy second to none. Uh, the, we are going to put the money into building a Navy that is able to um, directly confront a European peer competitor uh, on the high seas uh, and be victorious. Now, you know, incidentally, Navy second to none, the people that that freaked out the most was the British, because as, as people are probably aware, the British had a policy that they would have a larger Navy than the next two closest peer competitors. Uh, so when the United States came out and said in 1916, said, well, we're going to have a Navy second to none, the British were like, oh, the post-World War I era is going to be, you know, us and the United States are, are going to be the main competitors. Uh, and in, in fact, both sides of that question spent quite a bit of time in 1819, 1820, 1821, figuring out how they might have to uh, fight each other. Um, but uh, the naval buildup in 1816 uh, is, is, you know, coming on the heels of, I, I guess I should preface this by saying, that the, the uh, War of 1898 is, is a huge boon for the United States Navy. Now, you know, you could do an entire show about the War of 1898 and the issues and problems with that, and specifically the issues and problems that the Army have, and, and you know, it's, it's imperialism and it's all these other things. But, you know, whatever you want to say about it, um, it, it, it is a good news Navy story. 
right? So in 1898, you have two major naval battles, the, the, the Battle of Manila Bay and the Battle of uh, Santiago. Uh, both of those are, you know, gigantic victories. And again, we can get into why they're big victories. And it's, it's essentially it's target shooting against a very inferior fleet. But, but you know, nonetheless, good news Navy stories. Out of that comes a ton of naval spending. Uh, out of the War of 1898 comes a ton of congressional goodwill. Congress can't throw money at the Navy fast enough at the turn of the century. They completely rebuilt Annapolis. If you go to Annapolis today and you look at all the sort of the older turn of the century looking buildings, all of those are a product of the War of 1898. And hey, the Navy is great. We need to spend money on them. We need to educate naval officers. We need to have new ships. We need to so so this is the time this this is the mindset as we roll into you know 1910. Um, of course you've got the um, uh, uh, the, the Veracruz uh, excursion in 1914, which is another, you know, and, and we can have a debate about whether that was justifiable or not, but it's a good news Navy story. Uh, and, and so this is the context in which we arrive at this preparedness movement in 1916 uh, to have, to, to basically say to the world that it is our intent to have the largest and best Navy uh, in the world. And, and so all of this is leading up to uh, the declaration of war by the United States in 1917. And, and, and I think that, you know, there wasn't really a lot of uh, Navy interest in directly confronting the Germans uh, on the high seas in, in 1916, 1917. Um, you know, mostly because Wilson was running for re-election on a campaign of I've kept us out of the war, right? So it's not like, you know, the Navy's going to run around looking for a fight when Wilson is busy campaigning that he's staying out of the fight. Um uh, but certainly once we joined the war in, in 1917, uh, you know, really the major Navy, U.S. Navy story of the First World War is the fact that we escorted two million members of the um, uh, American Expeditionary Force over to France and transported two million members home and didn't lose a single one of them uh, to enemy action on the high seas. Uh, so that is the big U.S. Navy accomplishment for the First World War. Uh, that and sending a battleship squadron to uh, join the Royal Navy, uh, more kind of as a show of support than an actual uh, operational necessity. Uh, but we did have, you know, a squadron of six American battleships operate with the Royal Navy. Um, and, and certainly what was a success, uh, as I mentioned before, was all of the American destroyers that helped the Royal Navy protect all those convoys. Uh, so that's kind of the U.S. Navy story in the First World War. That's a great summary. Um, so if I may end off uh, this uh, really uh, great, very detailed uh, coverage of the issue. World War I is over. Uh, as you said, the empires have collapsed or been pushed into collapse. Uh, and the U.S. Uh, has this great navy um, that it, like you said, is so powerful that even the British consider it a peer competitor, even as uh, the army is being greatly drawn down. How did the, um, to the extent that they could, obviously, how did uh, civilian leaders and the naval officers think of how, what their job was going to be now uh, going forward in like, say, 1920, 1921? Well, I had already mentioned that, that, you know, the American interests and American, certainly business and commercial futures were focused on Asia uh, at the turn of the century. And uh, yes, World War I sort of detracts from that for a little while, but, but uh, certainly by the World War I time frame, American war planners understand that eventually our interests are going to conflict with those of Japan. Uh, the first War planning uh, in earnest against Japan happens as early as 1911. Uh, and by the end of the First World War, as, as soon as we get done, you know, uh, fighting in the Atlantic theater in the First World War, the Navy immediately begins to turn its focus to the Pacific. Uh, and and the, as you correctly point out, the Army draws down to like almost nothing. But uh, the Navy really doesn't go through that same sort of drawdown. Now, there, there's a whole thing with... Uh, arms limitations treaties in the 1920s that we could get into. But, 
but um, it is fully recognized that we're going to have to have a Navy that is ready to fight against a peer competitor at just about any time. You're not, you're not going to have the same sort of kind of spin up period that you can have for an army where you can put out a call for volunteers and put armies together and that kind of, you can't really do that as, as easily with battleships. And so the Navy doesn't go through this kind of same drawdown pain that the army goes through. Uh, but the interest is definitely turned towards the Pacific. Um, by the late 1920s uh, to the early 1930s, the Naval War College during their annual exercises every year is, you know, mapping out how we're going to fight uh, against Japan. Um, and, uh, you know, again, that, it, that could be a whole other podcast talking about that. Uh, but the Navy goes through a period of time where it's trying to organize itself. And of course, it's organized around battleships. Um, but at the same time, you get this introduction of this, this new idea of an aircraft carrier. And what does that mean and how do we employ it, right? Is the aircraft carrier part of the battle fleet? Is it supposed to do scouting? Uh, should it be its own thing? Is it actually an offensive arm in and of itself? Uh, these are all questions in the 1930s, and we don't necessarily have good answers to them. Now, you know, the people who do have good answers, unfortunately, are the Japanese. Uh, you know, but again, that's a whole other story. Um, but, uh, you know, all of this work, and you, you mentioned the Naval War College, and this is really sort of the golden era of the Naval War College. You know, all of this work is being done by all of the names that you're going to hear about in the Second World War. These people are all lieutenant commanders and commanders during this time period, and they're all hashing this stuff out in Newport. Uh, and thinking about how we're going to employ the fleet, um, what the strategy is going to be, what types of ships do we need to purchase, you know, what are their tactics going to be. Uh, so it, it really is, a, it's a fascinating time. It's not the one that I study, but it, it is a fascinating time period, the 1920s and 1930s. Well, that's certainly a fascinating time period, but you certainly uh, have uh, whetted my appetite, and I hope you've also whetted the appetite of my listeners uh, to learn about uh, the period that led up to this great golden age. Dr. Renfro, it has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you for your patience and uh, thank you for uh, providing us with such incredible detail. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. I always enjoy talking about this stuff. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.